So this is the second half of the lecture for the innovation course. And in the second half, we'll be talking about, uh, over the next 12 lectures, a book called Waves, which of course uh, we have uh, mentioned before. And this Waves is a novel that uh, in intended, among other things, to bring together science and art, the unity of science and art. We saw in the previous half of the innovation lecture about the importance of science and art, some of the great uh, inventors and innovators over time have integrated the humanities as well as uh, the sciences. Uh, several of you mentioned Steve Jobs and the, the smartphone as being great innovations and great innovators. They really combine the humanistic side with the technical side. So this is extremely important. Uh, the distinction between science and art is also a big challenge. In fact, one could call a tragedy in society and education not bringing together science and art. And I'm not talking about science students taking some humanities courses or about humanities students taking a few science courses. I'm talking about truly integrating them. And that's the purpose of this course. In fact, if we look at the big picture, and consider the whole COVID situation, uh, a lot of this tragedy is because of a difficulty in uh, engaging between these two sides, of the scientific side and the humanity side. The scientists have ideas about the virus, about vaccines and so forth. How do we bridge that? And also the, the political leaders and the humanistic side and uh, people who are not scientists how do they appreciate and communicate? And I think we've had some challenges with that. And it, if we could bring those two sides together, perhaps we could have responded or continue to respond better to this COVID crisis, uh, particularly in countries, not just in Korea, of course, where Korea has handled the situation fairly well. So this is an extremely important issue that we don't often talk about in education. And one of the purposes of this course is to uh, bridge science and art. The second purpose of this course is, this is a very unusual course, not just in Korea, not just at Digist, but around the world. There are very few courses, if any, that truly integrate science and art like we are going to do today and in the next uh, 11 sessions after this. So this course, or I should say this part of the course, is an innovation in itself. This is the first time I'm teaching it in this way. So I will be innovating and uh, you will see in fact educational innovation in progress and how we are innovating, how we're creating things and so forth. So innovation is not just a theoretical study. Innovation is ultimately a state of mind and immersion in innovation is the best way to teach innovation and therefore we are together uh, innovating. So I'm going to share, share the screen here. And uh, this is lecture number one, Unity of Science and Art with, Through Waves. We will talk about three chapters in the first triplet, as well as the preceding prologue. And I'll explain all this uh, shortly. I hope uh, all of you had a chance to read those three chapters in the prologue, the prologue and the three chapters, the first triplet. I understand that this might be a little bit of a different course. Maybe you didn't understand uh, the assignments and so forth, but uh, it will be much clearer today. And let's make sure that for the next session, we are prepared having read the second triplet as we'll describe. So this is the schedule of the course. We've done overview of inter innovation. We talked about uh, the definition of innovation the key concept of innovation being not just the new idea, but the implementation and successful adoption of that new idea. We discussed uh, innovation in biology last week and uh, earlier this today, we discussed the history of innovation. We gave examples like Leonardo da Vinci and uh, Michelangelo and people talked about Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and so forth and the very importance of integrating science and art. So today we're going to zoom in on the second half 
on this triplet, which has three chapters. We'll also do the prologue, as I mentioned. And the three chapters are Wo, wo ist Gott? Uh, wo ist Gott? That's German. And I'll translate that. Slaughterhouse is the second chapter. And Tiro a Segno is Italian for aim for the target, shoot at the target, which is the third chapter. So this is the book Waves. And as you know, it's available as an ebook on Amazon. Uh, you don't need the Kindle device. You can download the Kindle app uh, through your Amazon account and uh, then have the ebook on your any smartphone or device or computer, laptop, etc., synchronized through all your devices. Uh, the book also has a Goodreads site. You can find all of these by clicking on the PDF or just searching under Waves and, and my name. There's also a Facebook group for Waves, which I encourage you to join because there's lots of background information there. There's a LinkedIn page. And uh, we're putting some, uh, uh, increasingly some videos are being put on the TikTok channel for Waves. So what about the title? The title, Waves, is a metaphor for the science, the technology idea behind the book. So some people call it a science fiction, but it's more like science in fiction, not science fiction, but science in fiction. So it's, it is a work of fiction in itself that sometimes has nothing to do with uh, science. So it's not a pure science fiction, but it's science in fiction. But the waves is the uh, exemplification of the scientific idea. It has to do with electromagnetic waves. That's one reason for the title. Another reason for the title waves is it's about life itself. As we'll read shortly in the prologue, life, uh, goes in waves. People have ups and downs. Uh, that is just the nature of life. And uh, I think uh, literature expresses it better than a lecture, so we're going to do some reading. The subtitle is Überfaust. That's an interesting uh, concept. Most of you are familiar with the Faust legend, which we will also discuss shortly. That's a famous book by Goethe, but he's not the only one who, Wolfgang von Goethe, he was a German author, He's not the only one who wrote Faust. There were others, so it's a very famous story. And it's the proverbial, people have heard, the deal with the devil. You make a deal with the devil. Uh, and this is, Waves is a 21st century version of the Faust legend. And many people have written Faust versions. Goethe is a famous one, but there are others. Uh, like Thomas Mann wrote Dr. Faustus, Christopher Marlowe, the English, uh, and uh, Mikhail Bulgakov, the Ukrainian. Uh, wrote uh, Master Margarita, all different versions of the Faust legend. And so Faust is very ambitious. Faust wants to have uh, eternal knowledge and so forth. And so I thought if I want to write a Faust and I want to exemplify that uh, ambition, just like this innovation part of this course is exemplifying or hopes to exemplify innovation, then you don't want to just be a Faust, you want to even be a Uber Faust. Uber in German means above. So that's a little play on words. It's uh, part ambitious, part joke, as it were. So Waves is the title, and it's a 21st century version of Faust, Uber Faust. So the structure of Waves, there are 36 chapters, as well as the prologue and the epilogue, so 36 chapters. And uh, the chapters are organized in triplets. So 36 divided by three is 12. So there are 12 triplets. And the uh, book is essentially three books, what I call the Melodio, the Harmonio, and the Ritmo. So you see Melodio, Harmonio, Ritmo, which is actually Esperanto. Uh, it's a kind of universal language for melody, harmony, and rhythm. And one reason I use Esperanto is music is a universal language. So in, I, obviously the book is written in English. It has been translated in Korean, by the way. And, uh, but uh, I wanted to use this melodio, harmonio, ritmo in a universal language. And music is very important in the book. And so the melodio chapters are interlaced with harmonio and ritmo. So chapter one is Melodio, chapter two is Harmonio, chapter three is Ritmo, and then back again. So each triplet has one of the three books comprising 12 triplets. So today we will talk about the prologue and the first triplet. You'll see something also interesting in this diagram. The size of the chapter names get changed. 
So the melodia, its chapter names get bigger. So from Vo is Got all the way to Beyond Good and Evil. The Harmonio chapter names get smaller from Slaughterhouse to Adagio at the end. And the Ritmo chapter names are in the same size font, same size letters. And there's a reason for that, as we'll see. That's reason is that the melody or melodio, the front story, is a kind of political th thriller, medical novel, science fiction, not exactly, uh, as I mentioned, the whole thing is science in fiction. And these chapters get longer. That's, hence, that's why the letters get uh, larger. The backstory has two parts, the harmonio, just like music, the backstory is a harmony. It's a psychological thriller and a Bildungsroman. Bildungsroman is German for kind of a buildup, a story of the uh, character. And two very famous Bildungsroman is the Goethe's other work, or another work, uh, The Sorrows of Young Werther, and uh, another uh, one is uh, James Joyce's The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. These are two examples of Bildungsroman. Bildung is German for building, and Roman is uh, German for novel or story. And then the rhythm is a scientific dialogue, and it's a kind of creative nonfiction. Uh, so there are three books that are interleaved in this way. Now, this is a little bit of an animation of this changing structure. So let me go through this GIF. This is the Waves timeline. This is the beginning of the book. So the beginning of the book does not begin at the beginning of time, which is on the left here, nor does it start at the end of time. The beginning of the book starts in the middle. And there's a Latin phrase for this, res media, uh, many stories sometimes start in the middle. So it actually starts in the middle. And the blue is melodio, the uh, pink is harmonio, and the orangish, pale orange is the ritmo. And you can see that this is time over here on, uh, on the top. The melodio chapters, the time gets shorter and shorter. Time goes faster. And in the harmonio, time gets stretched out. And in the ritmo, the time period stays the same. And that's translated into chapter length. The chapters get uh, longer and longer, uh, and, and time gets compressed in the melodios. And the chapters actually get shorter and shorter, and time gets elongated in the harmonio. So there's these interesting uh, dichotomies occurring. So the Melodio, as I mentioned, is a third person thriller, goes into the future, time is compressed, space expands. And the Harmonio is a first person Bildungsroman, goes into the past, time gets stretched out, and space gets smaller and smaller. The action gets into a smaller and smaller space. And finally, the Ritmo is a scientific dialogue, stays in one day, time is constant, it's like a rhythm, space is constant. So let's start with the disclaimer. The disclaimer is in the very beginning of the book. It's usually very boring. It's usually for legal purposes. As you can read here, this is a work of fiction. Any similarity to persons living or dead unless otherwise specifically noted is merely coincidental. But this disclaimer is not just a legal thing. It talks about what is science and what is art. So the second paragraph of the disclaimer talks about the scientific aspect, and it says, no assurances are offered either implicitly or explicitly that these projections, trends, or forecasts will occur. It's kind of legal argument. All this being said, this book, like all art, is true. So that's very strange. Uh, how could something that you say, well, we don't know if it uh, will happen, but this is like art and therefore it's true. So like any art, there is a truth to it, good art, that relates to how human beings experience reality. You see a painting, you see a music, and you say, I have that feeling. The artist, the musician, the composer has recreated a feeling that's true to me. So there is, in all good art, a certain element of truth to it. And so to the extent that this book is art, it is true. Now I'll explain this more uh, a little bit later. But if you look at the third paragraph, it talks about 
This book is also a scientific treatise proposing within its pages a number of hypotheses and original scientific work where applicable has been cited. Disclaimers aside, this book, like all science, is falsifiable. So science is not necessarily truth. Truth is what we experience, but science is falsifiable, which is related to truth. So the artistic aspects, we cannot falsify. I cannot say if your happiness is you know, not happy. Your happiness is your happiness. That's your truth. I cannot falsify it. But I can say that you have two arms and two, three, uh, two legs. You know, we look at your body. We see the anatomy. That's science, you know, anatomy, whatever you want to call it. We, we can do studies on uh, the, the stars, the, the moon, you know, science. We can falsify it. We can never absolutely prove everything. We're not talking about mathematics. We're talking about science. But the essence of science is that it is falsifiable. So you see already that science and art have some complementary aspects. Art is not falsifiable. You can't say, oh, that's just uh, you know, bad art or whatever. That's, it depends on the experience. And so there's an element of truth to that art. And you can't say that uh, science is necessarily 100% true. Newton's laws were true until Einstein came along. And maybe Einstein's laws will be changed to another level of truth. We call that falsifiability. So these are complementary. So if you are only a scientist, then you're not appreciating this side of the art. If you're only an artist, you're not appreciating the other side. So like yin and yang, science and art are not opposites, but are kind of complementary. Let's talk about this artistic aspect a little bit more about truth. So this is a famous painting, L'Atelier Rouge, which in French means the Red Studio by the famous artist Henri Matisse. He painted this in 1911. This is his studio, and it is his truth about the studio. Now you look at this painting, and you say, that's not true. You know, that's not how the room looks. But to him and his perception of what he considers important, for example, the wine glass here, uh, the paintings, frames without paintings, this particular one with the woman here, uh, the man sitting, uh, some statues. These are the significant elements in his reality that represents, in a sense, the truth to him. You don't have to do everything exactly right to be true. In fact, if everything is exactly right and the world changes, then it's not true. And there's a famous quote by Matisse, excuse me, L'exactitude n'est pas la vérité. That is French for exactness is not the truth. So this painting is the true feeling, the true experience of his studio. So that's a little bit about science and art and the disclaimer. Let's continue now with the prologue. So the prologue is the beginning of the book. And it's actually before chapter one, obviously. And the subtitle to the prologue is Der Schwer Gefasste Entschluss. That's German for the difficult decision. And for those who have you read the prologue, it's very short, it's a couple pages long. It represents this decision that's a difficult decision. And it's a scene between Thomas and uh, his girlfriend at that time, Melissa, and they are essentially breaking up. And all of you are college students, so you know this experience about breaking up and all that. And in the scheme of things, in the whole world, this breakup, even though it seems like a tragedy, is not a big thing. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, it's painful or whatever and a uh, difficult situation, but in the scheme of things, it's, it's, a, it's just one event. And people maybe have another uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, and they go to the next thing and so forth. Uh, but at that time, it's a difficult decision. And uh, all of you have been through this experience, I'm sure. And so even though this book is about many big ideas, it relates to everyday experience and everyday decisions. So let's go a little bit about where the prologue is. So as I mentioned, this is the melodio on the right. And the harmonia goes into the past. The book starts in, in chapter one in media res in the middle. And the, the ritmo is sometime 
uh, in the middle of the harmonio, sometime in the middle of the backstory, if you will. The prologue is actually further back. It's not at the very beginning, in, the, in other words, chapter 35 of the harmonio, but it's somewhere around here uh, in terms of time period. So Thomas decides to break up with his girlfriend. And he gives the reasons for, he thinks he has the reasons for that. And that is the subject. The difficult decision is the subject of the prologue. So let's start with the first lines of the prologue. Infinity tempts us all, whether it be limitless knowledge, everlasting love, boundless wealth, ageless beauty, eternal fame, or whatever else known and unknown that motivates. Life, however, is finite. Between the infinite and the finite, at the point where imagination and reality meet, this is our present boundless struggle. So here, poised on the mystic prism, where infinity never, neither lives nor dies, but refracts, is where our story begins. So these are very big concepts, but they are exemplified in these average everyday decisions sometimes. Do you marry someone? Do you continue on a relationship? Do you find a new job? It's related to your Faustian ambitions. So the first discussion question, and I'll ask uh, shortly for your thoughts, I'm gonna go to each person, is what is your Faustian ambition? Before we go to that question, let's go a little bit about Faust. So this is from Wikipedia. Faust is the protagonist of a classic German legend based on the historical Johann George Faust in the 15th century. 15th, early 16th century. So the erudite Faust is highly successful yet dissatisfied with his life, which leads him to make a pact or a deal with the devil at a crossroads, exchanging his soul for unlimited knowledge and worldly pleasures. So Faustian ambition is something you want related to immortality. And the Faust legend has been the basis for many literary, artistic, cinematic, musical works that have been reinterpreted through the ages, and Waves is one of his works. Faust and the adjective Faustian imply a situation in which an ambitious person surrenders moral integrity in order to achieve power and success for a limited term. These are, it's more than that, of course, but this is from the Wikipedia, the definition of the Faustian element. So in, in English, we have a phrase, a Faustian bargain. You make a deal with the devil. Now, it's not the real devil, of course, although in some of the works, there is a devil, etc. In uh, Waves, it's different, which we will describe. So again, infinity tempts us all, whether it be limitless knowledge, everlasting love, boundless wealth, ageless beauty, eternal fame, or whatever else known and unknown that motivates. The difficult decision is that life, however, is finite. So let me ask now, what is your Faustian ambition? Anyone want to answer that? I know it's a difficult uh, question. So let's go to Kim Min Ung. Kim Min Ung, what do you think? What is your Faustian ambition? Don't be embarrassed. This is just for discussion. Kim Min Ung. Difficult question? Or is your uh, microphone off? Uh, hello. Hello. So, what is your Faustian ambition? How would you like to? be known in your life? What do you want to accomplish for that may last forevermore? Okay, let's go to next person. Uh, what is your uh, ambition? Uh, I want, uh, it's a pretty hard question. It's a very hard question, I know. Okay, well, let's continue. 
Uh -huh. uh, we'll go to the next uh, question. Okay, so when you read further in the uh, prologue, Thomas is with Melissa and he's thinking about the meaning of life, the purpose of life. So here's the lines. Thomas contemplated the Persian carpet at his feet. So they're in a room together and there's a Persian carpet. He remembered reading somewhere that among the pattern weave would be revealed the meaning of life. It was April outside a drizzling afternoon gloom. But here upon a threshold of new beginnings, Thomas felt an exhilarated tingle. Looking down, he pondered that meaning. I need to study, he said, tightening his lips. There's biochem, physics, senior thesis, and there were other deeper reasons, reasons he could not share. Melissa, beseeching a sign, any sign, had been searching Thomas's face even as he avoided her gaze, but now she too stared below at the intricate colors. She asked, what do you love? What do you really love? Thomas this time did not hesitate. I love knowledge, he replied, the mystery of life. He turned to face her. That is what I love. So the Faust legend is very interesting. Faust makes a deal with the devil in many of these uh, uh, books to go away from the spiritual and go towards the worldly pleasures. But in waves, Thomas, who is the Faust, is actually going towards knowledge. That's his purpose in life. And he is going away from the worldly pleasures. And this, of course, we're not gonna answer this question. One can never really answer this question. Does life have a purpose today or in this book? But this is the question that's being addressed. Melissa has a certain perspective on the purpose of life, the meaning of life. Thomas has a certain perspective. Now I should say one note. Uh, contemplated the Persian carpet at his feet, there's a reference to uh, W. Somerset Maugham's book called Of Human Bondage. It's a famous uh, English literature. It's actually about a doctor. And in that book, Of Human Bondage, it talks about the Persian carpet as having the meaning of life. And the meaning of life is that it's just a pattern and there is no predetermined meaning. Uh, I don't say that here but this is the cross-reference to W. Somerset Maugham's book of Human Bondage, which is a very interesting book. And I also uh, indirectly reference that because it's also about a doctor. It's not Faustian, but it has a, a, a epic quality to it. So I'll ask a question. Who wants to answer, does life have a purpose? E and G, does life have a purpose or what is the meaning of life? In this paragraph or no in your whole mind in your sense in your opinion ah uh, audio uh, and children difficult question um, i think uh, life doesn't have a purpose okay very interesting uh quest uh answer so these are one ideas and we're going to talk about it some more, but yes, indeed, maybe just life ends and that's it. And there is no meaning and no purpose. So these are, these are uh, very complex issues. So let's uh, continue. Thank you very much. E -U -U -G. So this relates to uh, a little bit what the e G said, uh, does one live to just enjoy life or for some higher purpose? Uh, this is the last lines of the prologue and it relates to the title waves. So I will read all is wave from the electrons granting matter its soft solidity to the spirit that warps and weaves waves are the rule. Destiny crests then falls civilizations rise and decay replaced by others. Good melds into evil, then back again. Hope and despair perpetually turn. From where we start, we end. Even reality, the present, is ephemeral. For by faith and fear, we grasp at the future, which in an instant slips into the past, out of reach forever. 
What was it we wished to have? Was it ever ours? And so we ride on that wave called life, struggling to swim forward, hoping not to drown, bobbing in a sea of fate as it sweeps us towards distant uncharted shores. And then that wave collapses, sending forth rainbowed ripples to seed other waters. We wonder what we were and what we have become, entwining the elemental forces in the spirit contingent, wave is all. So everything is a wave. I start with all is wave and I end with wave is all. And the electrons granting matter its soft solidity, that is actually the Pauli exclusion principle expressed in literature. From those you know physics, the Pauli exclusion principle says that two fermions cannot land on each other with the same quantum state, so the electrons cannot be squeezed together. So matter is solid, it cannot be squeezed infinitely, but it's a kind of soft solidity. So this literary phrase is an expression of the Pauli exclusion principle combined with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Of course, it's not precise, it's not accurate, it's not exact, it's not equations, but it is a literary expression of both of those in a very succinct way that approaches truth. Electrons grant matter its soft solidity. That's the science. And then there's the spirit, the spirit of the humanistic side that warps and weaves. For both of these, waves are the rule. We know in quantum mechanics, waves are important. And the same in the human side. Destiny crests and falls, civilizations rise and decay. We're talking about innovation in the Roman Empire. Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore. Some societies become innovative and some collapse. Another very important point, good melds into evil. We often say something is good, something is evil. Sometimes they mix, sometimes they switch. Uh, we see that in politics uh, with a conservative, liberal. The, when the conservatives are ruling, liberals are bad. When the liberals are ruling, conservatives are bad. Uh, things go in waves. It's not absolute. And then we also talk about even reality is ephemeral. So we talk about reality is very tangible, but that's just the present. And I, ironically, the present is, is gone. Right now, what I just said is in the past. So the reality is in fact very uh, ephemeral. And this is an important phrase, for by faith and fear we grasp at the future. There are two motivating aspects. One is hope or faith, and the other one is fear the positive and the negative. Um, and then we ride on that wave called life, struggling to swim forward. And then that wave collapses. That's related to what Yi Yun Ji said. Maybe there's no meaning to life. It just collapses, dead, goes to dust. But we also know this wave collapsing is related to quantum mechanics as well, sending forth rainbow ripples to seed other water. So even though the wave collapses, the life is dead. If we believe in that, it still has influenced other lives. And that's the meaning of this phrase here. Any questions? Okay. Let's now, we finish the prologue. I hope you had a chance to read it. If you haven't, uh, it's very short, of course, and, and you can read the prologue and uh, uh, have a newer perspective on that. Let's now go to chapter one, effectively the beginning of the book, uh, which is part of the modio, as I mentioned. And the subtitle to the chapter is Wo ist Gott? And uh, this is German, Wo means where. And so where is God? Now this chapter is not about religion or anything specifically, but it has a spiritual element, where is God? And the German Wo, is pronounced with a V, but uh, in English, wo, W-O-E, is a kind of uh, despair or difficulty or uh, turmoil, the negative thing. And so is God a negative thing? Because we know we, he's going to make a deal with the devil, but is the devil evil? What about God? Is it a difficult thing? Or not evil necessarily, but I'm, mixing these things by the subtitle Wo is God. In English, Wo is God. And uh, that is the, the concept here. Now the third line here is Allegro moderato con 
disperazione, which is the, all of the Melodio chapters have a musical uh, subtitle that relates to the, the tempo and the feeling and the speed. So it's a moderately fast with some desperation. Allegro moderato con disperazione. So that is the Melodio. So as I mentioned, this is a third person thriller. It's written third person, so it's about he, she, it, etc. Goes into the future, time is compressed and space expands. So the action gets more and more global. And so this is the Melodio here. So chapter one begins in media rest right in the middle here. And actually, as you can see, chapter two will start earlier than chapter one. Uh, chapter two will start at a previous time, but we'll go into that. So this is the very beginning of chapter one, the first lines. Squeezed between aspiration and despair, Thomas downshifted, pleading for the underpowered rental to cough up more torque. Like the little engine that could, the car groaned to scale the craggy ridges overlooking the Cote d'Azur, snaking along the Grand Corniche, perched between dream and reality, the Ford buzzed, clinging astride steep slopes etched by a winding blacktop that had once hosted growling Ferraris and McLarens, revving for the Grand Prix. The road markers of whitewashed stone, some erect, some awry, paced in weary meter the doctor's anxious ascent. For here in pilgrimage, high above Monaco, whether by obsession, desperation, or something else, Thomas, having struggled two decades for this moment, had come to force a deal. So this is the beginning and Thomas, the protagonist, is planning to meet Max, his friend, or a distant friend from college, who's a very wealthy hedge fund manager. That is, in a sense, the devil, the Mephistopheles of the Faust in this case. That doesn't mean all hedge fund managers are bad people or evil, but this is kind of the context. And Thomas is a doctor who's become uh, an entrepreneur and has a technology idea. It doesn't mean all doctors are good either. This is not the idea. There is often uh, a mix. But the point is, it's Thomas the Faust planning to make a deal with Max. So, this is a very difficult decision. This is a bigger decision than the one with Melissa. You know, is he gonna do this deal? And aspiration is ambition and, and hope and despair, of course, is very negative. And Thomas downshifted. And as some of you may know, many may not know, but cars come in automatic transmission and manual transmission. In automatic transmission, you don't worry about this, but in manual transmission, you can downshift the car. You go from a high gear to a low gear. And it's a little bit more complicated driving, but anyone who has driven a manual shift knows that downshifting, which is the activation of the gearbox to a lower gear, can do two things. It can either slow the car down, decelerate, or it can speed the car up, accelerate. You accelerate by pushing on the gas with the downshift and you decelerate by letting go of the gas and the engine will break and it will decelerate faster by downshifting. Now, why do I say this? Well, this is a little technical thing, but technology has two sides, good and evil. You can have nuclear weapons, you can have nuclear power. Electricity can help you know, make your computer run. You stick your finger in the electrical socket you can you know, die from the voltage. And they use electricity to kill people in the electric chair with the death penalty. Technology has two sides. So this gearbox with the acceleration and the deceleration is a metaphor for the two sides of technology. So a major theme of waves, and one reason why we're teaching this course in the Science and Technology Institute is the science that you do has these two human elements of good and evil. And as a scientist, you should be thinking about this, uh, or at least be aware of these issues. And so the very first line of this book is about this 
idea of the technology and its two sides. Squeezed between aspiration and despair, Thomas downshifted, pleading for the underpowered rental to cough up more talk. So he actually wants to, to uh, accelerate. So it depends on your intention, whether you decelerate or accelerate. So uh, another interesting thing is this phrase about the road markers. Road markers are little markers that, uh, especially when you're on a mountain, uh, to separate out uh, the place. And, uh, the, and they, there's a cliff that goes, so they mark the way. And they're usually in the stone, so they're white often, so you can see them. And there's some erect, straight, some are awry at an angle. And this is not a technology, but it's a kind of uh, object that's supposed to lead the way. It's supposed to guide you, but some of them are straight, and some of them are at an angle. So the guide is not always perfect to the way. Uh, and that's another important concept uh, in this book. So I'll ask a question to uh, the group. Uh, let's see who wants to answer. Uh, do you agree that technology has two sides, good and evil? Let's go to uh, Su Yun Yang, Su Yun Yang. What do you think? Does technology have these two sides, good and evil? Su Yun Yang. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. up, uh, uh -huh. yeah, I think technology always have two sides. Yeah. Uh, even if we don't know the, uh, Bad side now. Yes, but, that's right. Uh, but I think there may be uh, something bad in the yes. future. That's right. That's exactly, that. and I'm glad you said that because we don't always know this, and the technology itself does not give us the answer. The answer often comes from the humanistic side. For example, Facebook. Facebook. Oh, you know, Silicon Valley. Thank you very much, Su Yun Yang. That was a great answer. So, you know, Mark Zuckerberg says, this is the greatest thing where all everyone's communicating and bringing them together, right? But you've created uh, Facebook uh, mobs that uh, gather people to kill other people or the politics or uh, influencing elections and f fake news and disinformation and, and the Russians using this and the Chinese, whatever. Oh, it's a big mess. A lot of evil there. I mean, there's a lot of good there, but also a lot of evil. And uh, to be fair, I mean, I think people have criticized Mark Zuckerberg, but I don't think he was aware of this. I don't think he really thought about this. And why? Because he was just purely, you know, on the technical side. He was the technical genius, but not really seeing the big picture. A lot of Silicon Valley lacks this humanistic understanding. But you are going to be the future of innovation, Korea, and hopefully the world. And you are uh, top young scientists, students. You need to know about this and be aware of these issues. And you don't get that just from being a good scientist. As I said, there's the other side, the artistic side. So here's another aspect. So you know from chapter one that Thomas does something very bad in order to get to the make the deal. And so let's go through this. He glanced at the black bag resting upon the passenger seat. That's going to be his device, what he developed with the technology. Within this was the Novum Organum, which is a take uh, on um, the Novum Organum from, uh, uh, earlier, the new instrument, which possessed, expressed would be more accurate, the essence of life and its close twin death. Yes, this was something others might eventually reveal, but atop this peak, Thomas, for whom time and its twin money were scarce, resolved to cut that time. He had to, I must, he thought, return from this peak with a deal in hand. Trade my soul, then so be it. 
these was the this was in this world a far greater ideal and then he goes on that's why i put the line here thomas knew that quarreling with would be futile it was time for action he felt a shudder in his chest the only life he had taken had been back home a garden rabbit that experiment, the dirt gray bunny frantically scurrying away, had degenerated into an anti-vivisectionist comedy as Julian watched along with predatory glee. Julian is his cat. Animals would not do for here at Max's maison. Only a decisive impression, decisive impression, would seal the deal. Moreover, the device had been calibrated for human cardiac myosin binding protein. Thomas's cheeks flashed with a cold chill. He could make it happen now or hang paralyzed forever. Action for the surgeon cures all ills. So a couple things you'll notice here are these uh, boxes in the ebook version, they are footnotes. They are actual quotes from Goethe's Faust in the German translated to English, my translations. So uh, when he's looking at his uh, instrument for the secret now lies within reach, but only if one heard the sound it beseeched Will it turn to voice and thus become speech? So will he make it uh, real? And then with regard to his decision to act, steal yourself, tear open that door, which in dread others pass before. It's time to prove by deed that sore might raise a man up to God's floor. Before that somber cave, tremble no more, wherein the, man, the mind damns itself in tormented roar. So the question here, uh, is he is going to basically use this to kill Abdul, uh, also known as Bud. When is it right to sacrifice the few for the many? Or another way to put it, when is it right to do something wrong in order to do something right? These are very common issues. Now, I'm not saying you have to do crime or do anything obviously bad. This is an extreme situation but we often juggle these things. We are going to give vaccine to uh, you know, help with COVID. Some people may give side effects. In our clinical trials, some people may get affected, but we wanna help millions of people. Do we not do the clinical trial? Do we not do the vaccine because one person may die or one person may be affected? When is it right to sacrifice the few for the many? That is the essential question in this passage. So let me ask uh, somebody what you think about this question. Uh, <clears throat> Pak Minji, Pak Minji. Yes. What do you think? Is it right to do something wrong sometimes in order to do something right? Hmm. Or you oil? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can you give an example, maybe? I gave you the example of the vaccine. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. As, uh, uh, I know these are difficult questions. We will get better at this in the next lecture. So don't worry. Uh, we, will, we will go forward. Uh, let's go to the next one. We're a little limited for time, but thank you very much, Pak Minji. Now, this is very important. You might think it's a little bit extreme. Why does he have to do something very negative? Why can't he just be nice and friendly to Max? And Max says, oh, he's a nice guy. I'm going to give him the money. I'm going to fund the project. So, Early on, he says, was it the unknown finality of death that kept him alive? Or no, if he were to survive uh, such a plunge, was it the prospect of a ghastly living death like the gruesome outcomes he had all too often seen? Or perhaps what sustained him now was the hope that finally, finally, after so many wrong turns, he might, yes, succeed. Behold the two chief fiends of man enslaved and chained by hope and fear. I'll hold them back from this clan. Make some way, salvation is near. So what this is expressing is what motivates more, rewards or threats? For example, if I say, oh, I'd like you to answer and be involved in the class because I'll give you an A 
or I'll give you a good grade. How does that compare to if you don't answer, I will fail you? So one is a reward, what uh, Goethe says, hope. The other one is a threat, which is what Goethe calls fear. Now, <clears throat> there's an interesting study by Daniel Kahneman, the behavioral economist, actually a psychologist. He got Nobel Prize for behavioral economics. And in economics, you have money, gain, and loss. But losses have more emotional impact than gains. Threats are more powerful than gains. So you see in the news about bad news, about uh, bad things. Well, bad news sells more, attracts more attention. Threats can be more emotionally powerful. It's a, not necessarily a good lesson, but that's one of the things that Thomas understands is that he wants to do this technology to make better medicine, to save lives. But somehow that doesn't attract as much attention as the negative side. That uh, attracts more attention. So the military side. And as you know, sometimes in innovation, the military and war creates more innovation than peace. There's more motivation then. So I'll ask a question. Uh, what motivates more? What do you think? Rewards or threats? Let's go to Chue Jiu. Chue Jiu, what do you think? What motivates more, rewards or threats? Mm, it I think it's really different case by case, but okay. I think threats each motivate more. Yeah, so I think that's a very good answer because it depends, of course. But this is the why I mentioned Daniel Kahneman, the psychologist, Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist, loss aversion, the emotional to threats and loss is a bigger psychologically than the gain. So even though the money amounts might be similar, so logically, rationally, they're the same, uh, they end up psychologically being different. So uh, in general threats, and this is, this is maybe not a nice message, but threats are more motivating. So here's another very interesting line. So you have Thomas, who has the idea, and then you have uh, Max, who has the money. And you see this in society very often. You have the money people, the venture capital, and the people who give money to venture capital, and you have the idea people, and they don't always have money. Why is it separate? That's a very interesting concept. Uh, why do you have to invest in other people? Uh, why don't the, the, the rich person have all the ideas and the poor person doesn't have ideas? Why is it often the, uh, the other way around? So this is also related to bar, bar behavioral economics. Loss aversion and gains, uh, if you don't have a lot of money, you have a lot more motivation perhaps to come up with new ideas. If you have a lot of money, maybe you are more comfortable and you don't have that kind of motivation. So. Here's a, a passage that relates to this. As power was never motivating for Thomas, was it the thirst for knowledge and ambition to redo the world, the super ego run amok? But he had had enough of trying to make sense of his motivations. Action was what now mattered. And action meant money. So strange he mused how it could be that the worlds of wealth and ideas were so disjoint. But was not money just an idea, something after all based wholly on belief? What if some simply did not believe anymore? And since when, he wondered, did finance come to rule its master? For Thomas, ideas ruled. He was in the world of ideas. But regardless, with money as not so obedient serf, he recognized that the novum was nothing without it. Looking out upon the rippling sea, sensing a deal, his idea joined with wealth, imminent Thomas sighed. What is it you want? asked Max, unnaturally subdued. Thomas turned to face the financier. Investment, there are many applications for good or evil. And Goethe writes, to whom it may concern, whoever owns this paper is owed a thousand crowns, backed up it is, pledged with certain bond. He talks about the idea of money. 
So any thoughts on that, this concept? Let's go to uh, An Sang Jun. An Sang Jun, what do you think uh, of this question? Why is it that those sometimes with money are not always the ones with ideas? Um, I think uh, creativity is not related with money. So these are not related? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, very, thank you for that. Let's continue. So now we move to chapter two. Chapter two is the harmonio. This is the backstory and it's in the first person. The subtitle to chapter two is Slaughterhouse. And the sub subtitle, the third title is Corruption Has Its Price. So in the Melodio, you had the musical third title. Here you have uh, some other concept that summarizes. And this is from uh, uh, part two of Goethe's Faust, Palace of Menelaus. Stir up that which was in the past, the most evil more than the good, the somber darkness that was cast, not the present shine it would, but also in the future scope, glinting, gentle glimmers of dawning hope. So let's look at the harmonio. This is starts before the previous chapter. It's actually Thomas's explanation from the first person why he went to make this deal. In fact, the whole harmonio is why he went to make this deal, to make this uh, situation where he balances good and evil, etc. And in a sense, by making that deal, he starts the whole thriller of the melodio. So it's first person Bildungsroman, goes into the past, time stretches, space compresses, and there's a frame narrative with his friend Dave where they meet in the lounge at the O'Hare Airport in Chicago. It's a medical school friend of his, Dave. So these are first person where he goes and, and Dave says, are you sure you want to go to Monaco? Are you sure you want to do this deal? And Thomas says, let me tell you the stories. Let me tell you about it. It's his good friend. So there's a two first persons. There's a story with Dave in the airport lounge. And then he's talking about the past. So that's chapter two. So here's the frame. And this is the very beginning. My friend Dave was worried, very worried. Seeking a deal with the notorious Maximilian Iblis, he told me, sounded like a bad, bad idea. I knew Dave from med school. After graduating, he had taken the straight track towards a fine career in radiology. My path, you could say, was more curved. While those happily frenetic days grappling with pathology of the textbook and female kind were but lingering memories, Dave and I had remained the closest of friends. He was also, you should know, the very first person I'd shared the novum with. That, I remember the moment well, was over 20 years ago. So they talk and all that, and then this is the transition to the narrative. So tell me, Dave, what made you decide on this? As we were both doctors, I figured I'd tell the story backwards, like a medical history, starting with the recent past, ending with decent, distant memories. So I mentioned about the Bildungsroman with James Joyce, the artist as a young man, and uh, Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther. They start from the beginning like a standard history, but a medical history goes backward in time. And that's how the harmonio is constructed. So he continues to Dave and he says, it was just before the new year, call it an epiphany. And then he starts, late December, those bitter snows that blow in from the lake, this is in Chicago, were already whipping through the city, but warm enough it was inside the Knickerbocker, where a small crowd had gathered in the anteroom outside the Grand Ballroom. Here, illuminated by tinsel chandeliers and recessed lighting, the old and the new washed each other out in the brightness. The faux gold trim, floor to ceiling mirrors framed in oak, the fleur de lis patterned upholstery, tuxedoed butlers too, announced to the world of Chicago, all zest and zeal, but comfortably neither, 
was a player. And Goethe writes, with princely carpeting, in translation, with princely carpeting, broad walls ornate, nooks and niches bedecked with armor plate, no need, I think, for any magic play by themselves, these spirits will find their way. So the problem in Chicago for Thomas is he wants to make this idea happen, but there's a lot of corruption, also uh, evil, if you will, and he doesn't make any progress. He is very frustrated. He has to go outside the box, outside of his world. So let's start with uh, this uh, corruption. Nina chafed too at my American style optimism. Nina is his wife. They're together at this event at the Knickerbocker in Chicago. False hopes engendered by blithe smiles she knew were disingenuous. She once told me that though Marxism was a fairy tale, she should know. It allowed her to see with abject clarity the fantasies here too. Some people are more equal than others, made Orwellian farce of Soviet communism. Likewise, some people have fewer opportunities than others, summarize the unstated suppressed truth of America, brought up reading an eclectic mix of officious Pravda dispatches and banned foreign literature. This was how she saw it. Then, as I recalled one particular stymied venture, there was Illinois, an acquaintance of mine, Jack, highly placed in state politics, reminded me that in line with the other Tartuffes, the forum was greased not with fanciful dreams, but with generous gifts for the double-breasted, sometimes sweat-suited governor. And in translation, Goethe writes, there once was a king with a mighty big flea, the love for whom he'd sing like his own son he'd be. And then later on in the chapter, though the cattle and hog slaughterhouses of the West Side were long gone, the butchery continued. This much Mailer was right about. In Chicago, money loot was the holy elixir that fortified the lubricious they called a pay to play. But the Windy City eluded such simple des description, stark conventional contrasts as in rich versus poor, a pseudo Marxist application of physics to history did not apply. Indeed, in these modern age stockyards were slaughtered the very wealthy by those in or out of the law moving in on their turf. The slayers would slay and in turn be slain. That's the whole concept of the slaughterhouse. A man of good intentions will to bribes and flattery bend the judge who cannot punish will to crime and caper tend. So what is corruption? Is it impossible to completely eliminate corruption? So let me ask uh, uh, How about uh, Kong Yong J? Kong Yong J. What do you think? Kong Yong J? What do you think of this question? What is corruption? Is it impossible to completely eliminate corruption? Uh, These are big questions. Audio warrior, I know. What, what, what do you think is corruption? If you help a friend, is that corruption? I can't hear you. Uh, hard to tell. It's hard to tell, yeah. Well, let me give a little context, okay? Now, the purpose of this lecture is not to be political, but sometimes, you know, corruption occurs because of things with family members. Not always, but uh, sometimes, right? And of course, in Korean culture, family is extremely important. And uh, we've seen things with uh, helping other family members and stuff like that with chayballs and government and all that. And you remember the whole story with Park Gun hee And one argument she made for her election was, she does not have a family. Her family is a Korean state. And people understood that, well, maybe she's not going to be corrupt if she doesn't have some brothers or children or husband that she can, you know, create some situation. 
they felt that she would not be corrupt because she said, Korea is my family. I don't have a family, her tragic story and all this. But as we know, she had her uh, friend, Sun Tzu Il, I forget the name, et cetera. But uh, then the whole thing got uh, out of control. And there was another level of family, if you will. This is very tricky. What is corruption? Because helping your family, is that corruption? Not necessarily, but sometimes it does. Very difficult questions. So let's go, uh, I'm going to play a video now. It's on TikTok and also YouTube, so listen carefully. Nina chafed too in my American style optimism. False hopes engendered by blithe smiles she knew were disingenuous. She once told me that though Marxism was a fairy tale, she should know. It allowed her to see with abject clarity the fantasies here too. Some people are more equal than others made Orwellian farce of Soviet communism. Likewise, some people have fewer opportunities than others. Summarize the unstated, unsuppressed truth of America. Brought up reading an eclectic mix of officious Pravda dispatches and banned foreign literature, this was how she saw it. Then, as I recalled one particular stymie adventure, there was Illinois. An acquaintance of mine, Jack, highly placed in state politics, reminded me that in line with the other Tartuffes, the forum was greased not with fanciful dreams, but with generous gifts for the double-breasted, sometimes sweat-suited governor. Okay, so uh, that's actually short videos. I wanted to emphasize that the music is very integral to the book. And there's music throughout, as you know, there are musical analogies, there's music in the background, music reference. And uh, this concept of the waves, of course, is related to music, and we're gonna develop this idea further. So we're running a little short of time, so I'm gonna go a little more quickly. Uh, other aspects of Chicago irked me. Flatness ruled the pra prairie. There was virtually no opportunity as such to pursue a favorite hobby of mine, rock climbing. That's a personal thing. It was an apt metaphor, for in this town it was better not to climb, but to lie low, where rising was measured more by pushing down than by pulling up. In other words, wealth was not created, it was shuffled around with somebody, invariably lurking, to pluck to their picking. So long as the dollars whipped around and round what the economists call the velocity of money, all would be well. The wind, you could say, made the weather. And Chicago's famous for being windy. All this was subject to a paradox. Market fundamentalism, itself a form of worship, assumed, exalted really, that equilibrium prevailed, yet the requisite money flows implied non-equilibrium. Few of such faith recognize this contradiction, and not understanding this, many substituted ignorance with optimism. Optimism, blind faith, differed from measured hope. This was the message Nina persistently wished to impart to me. It was also the lesson Kostakis had learned and would play to adroit advantage. Then I referred to John Nash, who was famous for his game theory and equilibrium, et cetera. A very fundamental concept, is the free market really free? We talk about freedom and we talk about free market, uh, et cetera. But in reality, if you look at the actual aspect of this, because everything is in transition, the market is always at a non-equilibrium state. It's almost never really free. I mean, there are some cases in the commodities exchange and, and so forth. And this is one of the things with behavioral economics. So a lot of these free market arguments are not uh, necessarily correct, even if they mathematically play out. You have to combine it with the humanism. One reason why Daniel Kahneman got this Nobel Prize for behavioral economics, he combined the science and math of economics with the humanism of psychology. Now, the other thing you'll notice that the chapter two is very depressing. And you notice the music that was there, the cure, faith. And uh, this type of depressing mindset is behind this chapter. The whole book is not depressing, don't worry. But chapter two is depressing. And that depression creates this desire to do something that leads to chapter one. Okay, so then he talks about, uh, we're not going to go through this whole portion, but when you don't like a situation, do you fight or do you leave? And so the very last lines, I will read the last section, not this first part, but uh, the last lines of uh, 
chapter uh, two ways. But these minor tragedies were of no interest to me. Receiving all that I needed, I could now behold, as Kostakis phrased it, Kostakis is a speaker, a famous financier, a future to be shaped. Leaving behind the weary, lingering crowd, Nina and I retrieved our coats and headed out, holding hands into the snowy blast of Chicago's wind. Frigid January, whispers of old Lang Syne already seemed blowing. The holidays lurked but a week away, and gifts such as a Helen wasted by the Trojans and its requited Grecian return would have to be bought and borne. The words from a song, I went away alone with nothing left but faith, laid down a silent refrain in my seething, dispirited, but hopeful mind. Thumos and anti-thumos simmering as one. So he decides to leave and he's going to make this deal in Monaco. Now, a couple points here, thumos and anti-thumos, the, the footnote here. So if you have the ebook version, there'll be a footnote relates to, uh, in Greek philosophy, uh, Plato, there were three parts of the uh, personality. Logos, logic, thumos, which was uh, uh, emotion, and uh, I'm, I'm summarizing, and eros, which is love and desire. And so he had this depression as well as this hope Thumos and anti-thumos coming together. In Plato, they don't talk about anti. So in waves, there are six dimensions to the personality. Logos, anti-logos, thumos, anti-logos, eros, anti-eros. And we'll discuss this more in the course. And again, this is just a theory uh, building on Plato. But what's interesting is people make life decisions when they have two opposite aspects coming together. They have to resolve them. And Thomas here has Thumos, the uh, seething, dispirited frustration combined with the hope and the ambition, anti-Thumos in this case, coming together. And he makes the decision. So let's go to the last chapter, chapter three, Tiro Asenio. Proteins are where the action is. And in Goethe, when you learn the stars' course taught by nature as your source, then you'll see your soul's force. By the way, uh, I forgot to mention chapter two, the harmonio. It's first person, but you may have noticed that the writing is more poetic, more uh, emotional than in the melodio, which is more like a thriller. So these different feelings of the books are there, so they're interleaved. So the ritmo is yet more different. It's a scientific dialogue, stays in one day, time is constant, they're basically one hour tutoring blocks, and space is constant, it happens in the medical student dorm of Thomas during this time period. So it's before the beginning of the book, and it's midway, if you will, time-wise, in the harmonio. So chapter three is there. And chapter three is a scientific dialogue. So Waves, as you may know, is actually three books interleaved, Melodio, Harmonio, Ritmo, the Ritmo is the use of fiction, dialogue in particular to communicate science has a long history in all of these works. And this uh, post is in the Waves book in Facebook group. So this is the link, uh, facebook.com groups, Wave the book. I encourage you to join and there's a lot of background content. So all of these have links. So there are many examples. Galileo is one of the best examples of dialogue to communicate science. And that's what the Ritmo is. It's a dialogue. Now it's a dialogue with a little bit of a frame. So each dialogue has a frame, which is in third person. So he talks about one of his uh, heroes from high school. Thomas had always been an idealistic sort. Roald Hoffman, who got a Nobel Prize in chemistry, named after that intrepid Norwegian explorer, another one of his heroes another of his heroes, had delivered the commencement address at Thomas's high school graduation. He exhorted these eager graduates not to focus solely on grades, not to take the road well-traveled, but to seek out as they embarked upon college, new beginnings, new worlds. This is very relevant to you, 
Now you are in college. This advice resonated with Thomas for the rest of his life. But such idealism was bound to clash with reality. Thomas then, having many times journeyed down the road not taken, had now to be very practical. The lessons began near dawn and concluded late into the evening. This, the 12 chapters of the Ritmo, is the story of one of those days up at the medical campus, here in Thomas's cloistered dorm room, his home and classroom. So in life, is it better to be general or specialized, to follow the common path or to follow the unusual one? This is a question that you must answer have answered before, but you will continue to answer in your career. Do you follow the pathway, conventional pathway, or you do you try to do something different? Uh, these are very difficult questions. And most people, to be honest, will follow the common pathway. And that is the uh, concept here. So as Goethe writes, to the farm fields go away now, fall upon chopping and sowing yourself in your mind, you should plow within circles narrowly knowing. And then in the witch's kitchen, Faust uh, Goethe writes, a narrow life fits me not at all. So this is not the Faustian idea. But that's the tension that we described in the prologue between the finiteness of life, to get things done, to make a living, to care for your family, and then the wider ambitions. So Thomas is sitting in his room and he has this statue and he talks about civilization, the history. The Cycladic figurine's flat sloping face, face had one feature, a sculpted linear nose. To Thomas, this late Neolithic relic, as abstract as anything modern, could only have been created by an advanced civilization, the first civilization. That the mythic descendants of Apollo and Artemis died, replaced by the more organized Minoans, was for him an important fact. The statue reminded him of the frailty, not only of individuals, but also of entire cultures, a parable for the ebb and flow of humanity. The idol possessed yet greater significance with that primordial tyrant, King Minos. Civilization became doomed to coexist with tyranny. In Thomas's mind, the Cyclades had been the original Eden before the cruelties of organized society had been discovered the idol marked the loss of true innocent human civilization when individuals, not tyrants, ruled. So these are uh, concepts about civilization. One of the inspirations is not just this uh, ancient work, which is very uh, remarkable. It's uh, from before the ancient Greeks, it's Cycladic, uh, late Neolithic, but it looks very modern. But uh, it's also, uh, one of the aspects is related to uh, Sigmund Freud's very famous book was very influential for me, Civilization and Its Discontents. So civilization is a kind of tyranny. It, it creates opportunity. It's a great thing, but it also is related to organized society. What is part of, what is, what makes a civilization great? The individuals or organization? What is the balance of that? to mark the civilization. So these are some of the concepts here. So then the uh, Socratic dialogue continues with Thomas and Mark. And so one of the, they go basically going to talk about DNA and proteins. So in the beginning, Thomas says, yes, you can see the two strands intertwined. This is the double helix of DNA, like love's two threads in Plato's symposium. So he's making a connection to Plato and philosophy, each seeking its better complementary half. Plato said that love happens because of two opposites attract. Instantly recognizable, the double helix is yes at icon. So then Thomas starts to talk about Watson and Crick. Watson and Crick's discovery, you see, was both deductive and inductive science. In this way, their science was like art. Through deductions based on facts, they created a picture. And via induction, based on intuition, they provide an explanation. In our time, deduction alone of the ultra-analytical sort is often mistakenly equated with science. But deduction, Mark, is the stuff of computers. Imagination is what makes us human. Science must embrace both the deductive and the inductive. Great science is art, and in that way, all the more truthful. 
So that relates to the disclaimer I mentioned that art is truthful. Great science has an artistic aspect. So not only is it falsifiable and analytical and deductive, but it is also inductive. And that makes it closer to truth. Uh, I will skip this section because it's a little bit specific about uh, health insurance and genetic profiling. Uh, but let's go to this one. It's very important. So on the top, you see a protein. On the right, you see DNA. So DNA is very uh, interesting. Uh, and Thomas talks about the discovery of DNA with Watson and Crick's. So Thomas, I agree. Proteins, as you see, have more complex structures than DNA which is strung out, you could say, in quadratone monotony. And so what's the point, asked Mark. Thomas, well, two points, actually. First, DNA captures the imagination. The combination of boring uniformity with infinite variety makes it both easy to study and also impossibly mysteriously to fathom, an emotionally compelling combination. Second, proteins are diverse and complex. They don't extend in a nearly infinite linearly spiral structure but come in a myriad of sizes and shapes. Some are roughly spherical like hemoglobin, others elongated like myosin. Collagen is thin like a cable, yet others are a mix of the globular and extended forms. So proteins can be quite difficult to study. It's human nature, right? Preferring the easy over the difficult. So a lot of focus has been on the DNA and the genetics and et cetera. But what Thomas is arguing is that the variety is in the proteins. And he says it's human nature to do the easier. So Goethe says, easily grows man, so lax and mellow in full repose, there he like, lies like jello. Basically, people like to be lazy. Now, it's interesting. If you look at the first test for COVID, they were PCR tests, the test for the RNA. They were genetic tests. The other tests, like the antigen test and the antibody tests, are more complex, more difficult. But potentially, if we have an antibody test, we know if people are immune, the right one. And if we have an antigen test, we know that the virus is there. The PCR test was very easy to do. That was the first one. Korea was very good at it. They did the PCR test based on the RNA and uh, present, the genetic. But, you know, there are false negatives, and it's very sensitive. It has to be the PCR reaction. Uh, my prediction is that the testing will go beyond that. It will involve more sophisticated antigen and antibody tests. So what is the future of medicine? Then Thomas talks about uh, medicine, radiation, proteins, DNA is the target. He's arguing that proteins are the target and we can approach medicine both from uh, molecule side or medicines or from radiation side. So Thomas, right, we can summarize the two by two with a two by two, a table with the therapeutic modalities, drugs and radiation along one side and the molecular targets, proteins and DNA along the other. So you can see the use of radiation, some form of radiation directed at protein targets is an area open for development. I put question marks there. But right now there's nothing to fill that box, no such treatments. Both medical and military applications are also possible. As these rays, this electromagnetic wave, waves, could incapacitate critical protein functions, they can be used to stop cell growth, the kind of uncontrolled cell proliferation seen in cancer or inactivate a neuromuscular junction protein just like the one Curare binds to. So whether the technology is used for life or death, just like chapter one with the downshifting, depends not just on the mode of application, but also on the intentions and moral constitutions of the operator. Just like the first sentence of chapter one, what you do with the technology depends on what your intentions are. Are you gonna use this radiation to kill or to cure? That's what he's saying here. Now, this is a very important passage. He starts to end the discussion with discussion of medicine in general, being a doctor. What is most important in medicine? Diagnosis, therapy, or prognosis? So Thomas starts. Let me explain. There are three parts to medicine. Diagnosis, therapy, and prognosis. The Hippocratic approach to medicine focused more on prognosis than diagnosis, emphasizing the causes of diseases rather than, as was the case then, the empirical categorization of individual cases. In the latter case, diagnosis might be possible, but prognosis generally is not. Prognosis comes from underlying the underlying 
understand the underlying causal factors, causality adding context and meaning to existence, is at the core of science, art, and after Hippocrates, medicine. In short, prognosis, predicting the future, is the greater challenge. Let's frame this personally. Say you're diagnosed with lung cancer. You want to be treated and you certainly wish to survive. You might also be interested in the specific diagnosis, whether it's small cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma. But of utmost importance to you as a patient is your prognosis. Will I survive? How long will I live? Will I be disabled? Can I still have sex? How will my life be changed? This is what is vital to you. Mark, I agree. Thomas, prognosis is paramount. Therefore, I qualify the opening comment at the beginning of our session that genomics isn't important. When it comes to what's valuable for patients, knowledge, prognosis in particular, is important. Knowledge, my friend, has intrinsic value. So why do I frame this here? Because what's interesting is if you make a medical technology, the diagnosis, the treatment, et cetera, that's what most of the science is focused on. But is that really what people are interested in? People are interested in how their life will be, what will be their prognosis, what is their future like. Now, of course, the diagnosis and treatment influence that, but they are only on the path to what is truly valuable, and that is the humanistic side. So this is the end of the Ritmo. Mark scribbled out a $40 check. He added out from the room itself a study in claustrophobia with peeling paint, walls packed with books, feeling the hour had passed with more questions than answers. But questioning the nature of life was far better, this ex-broker concluded, than waiting tables. Well, maybe not entirely better, he thought, as he contemplated his dashed dream of becoming one of those masters of the universe on Wall Street. Though becoming a Kostakis was not in the cards, being a doctor, he mused, wasn't too shabby. Thomas stood up, tucked the check in his pants pocket, and followed his student to the door. He sensed Nora had already arrived. And yes, as he opened the door, as Mark slipped out into the hallway, she was there, books clasped close to her chest. Though Thomas dreaded the long day ahead, he was aware now of a warmer feeling, closer to hot actually, the unmistakable pang of nervous anticipation. So he has some feeling for Nora, and he is looking forward to that. That's the anticipation, not only for Thomas, but hopefully for triplet number two. So in anticipation next week, you should read chapter four, five, and six, the second triplet, and we will have discussion questions on that after our introduction to the history of innovation in Korea. So we've uh, approached the end of our hour or uh, time. And uh, I hope this was uh, interesting for you. And uh, if you haven't started reading, please do. Uh, and uh, be, I will send the questions out for next week as well. There's lots of things to think about, lots of things to learn uh, with this book. So thank you very much and have a good uh, weekend.